four score, and a full head of hair to go, I was faced with the prospect that my niece was approaching a very special birthday. Now, this wasn't your typical play school trite, cute clothes, stuffed animal, Disney VHS kind of a birthday. Oh no, this was much more significant. The child was showing signs of hyperintelligence, coupled with a steely-eyed visage, and evidence from this photo, a taste for blood. Now, my own daughter is a few years older, and I'm familiar with this look of white-knuckle determination. On her third birthday, my brother and I had caught her red-handed trying to make off on a quad that I think belonged to Minnie Mouse. Luckily, we were able to dodge the cops that day, but I figured out that I had to satisfy her need for speed, and also at the same time satisfied my need for a skilled laborer, so it was a win-win. I was eager to dip my toe in a new project, something that coupled my favorite aspects of machines, electronics, art, and craftsmanship. I was racking my brain for a few days, trying to figure out what a kid this age really wants, no, really needs. The answer was right in front of me. Why not get this kid a sweet set of wheels? Besides, during my period of personal reflection, I asked myself, what would my dad do in this situation? This guy's been operating dangerous heavy machinery ever since he was in diapers. We're talking about the original American badass here. Father of three, master of machines on land and sea, and all forms of horsepower. No stranger to technology, men's fashion, women's fashion, and he has documented proof of being a person you can depend on. I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen? Well, dad did cut off a finger when he was a kid, but nothing bad like that ever happened to me. The worst I got was having to pose for 80s style family photos dressed like Pee Wee Herman. Okay, that's enough fooling around. So I settled on doing a pedal car, but with a twist because this kid was barely walking. Uh, I thought it would be cool to maybe make it an electric version of a pedal car. Then, you know, add some remote control. Brilliant. So I started by finding a donor car, and these suckers are hard to find for a decent price. I guess everybody's doing electric pedal cars these days. <laughs> Whatever. I found new kits out of a speed shop that I buy parts from in Nebraska, and I had high expectations. When it arrived, my expectations were quickly snuffed, as the build quality left a lot to be desired. Okay, I'm not trying to be a snob here, but this thing came straight off the boat from the Far East. And when inspected, it appeared to have been made on a Friday. By a blind person. <laughs> It did come with some cool chrome trim pieces, though, and it was made of a space-age material called steel, and it really looked the part of a classic pedal car, so I couldn't complain that much. I welded up a basic frame using square tube steel, and I laid it out to the original wheelbase. Reusing the axle and the wheels from the kit, I added two pairs of pillow block bearings to mount the rear and add uh, a drive shaft that would transfer power from the electric motor through a chain and sprocket setup. The motor returns the shaft, the shaft turns the wheels, Pretty simple. This allows me to fine tune the speed and torque ratios by selecting the appropriate sprocket sizes. The objective here was a reasonable ground speed and not to do like a full funny car pull shot. Uh, the front axle is just a simple solid kingpin with some tube stock spindles and bronze bushings. The front wheel and axle stubs were harvested out of the kit components. A battery tray was added in the front that fits two rechargeable lead acid batteries and the makings of a steering shaft was fitted out with a tube and some press-in ball bearings. In the very back, a variable speed DC motor was mounted. This one came out of the cheapest e-bike sped up I could find on Amazon, which included the motor, drive sprocket, speed controller, and a very low quality twist grip throttle that uses a hall sensor. The steering works with a 12 volt DC gear motor that I harvested from a seat recliner. This drove the steering shaft through a rack and pinion gear connected to the front wheels through a bell crank. The motor mounted on a pivot to remove slack from the bicycle chain that ultimately spins these pizza cutter wheels. The electronics portion of this is probably too much to talk about for just one video. But at a high level, it's a split system. One side is dedicated to the low voltage RC receiver 
that drives the standard servo motors. These servos operate cam switches that control a set of power relays connected to the second side. The power electronics for the DC motors and the speed control. All this electrical stuff packaged under the steering column behind a small dashboard. Aluminum diamond plate was used for the floor panel. What you see here is the state of the body as I received it in the kit. Gigantic dents, split lines, and factory equipped rust bombs. The overall form has some good character. Kind of like a cross between an early Corvette grille, a Roadmaster nose, some portholes, and God knows what for a tail. But it's a great starting point. I hid all the electronics behind uh, some panels I made out of diamond plate. And that was really to keep uh, curious fingers out. Uh, the steering gear moves a rack and pinion attached to a bell crank. The business end of the crank hooks up to one of these steering arms and a drag link connects across to the opposite wheel. The steering arms had an Ackerman geometry and is fully adjustable for tow through turnbuckles. Uh, pretty much uh, just hardware store stuff. This bird's eye view of the steering gives you a good understanding of the Ackerman setup I was talking about. It's named after a guy in my hometown that is renowned for passing bad checks. Just kidding. It's named after its inventor, and it's a simple trapezoidal four-link geometry that allows for a steeper relative road wheel angle on the inner turning wheel. If that doesn't make sense, just look at this cheesy cartoon I made that explains it better. Ackerman is really essential to make sure that the car will turn flat and smooth and resist the urge to lift the inner wheel when cornering. And while on the subject of resisting the urge, I couldn't resist the urge to get a cheap Chinese moped horn, mainly just to stick it to my brother for all the obnoxious noisy toys he had bought my daughter over the past few years. Checkmate, bro. The dashboard was next with some stylistic input from my slave driver of a shop foreman. It has cutouts for a battery meter, kill switch, on-off switch, as well as a horn button, charge port, and a light switch. Uh, the rear drive uses bicycle chains, and I ended up removing a couple of links just to take up the slack. So at this point, it was pretty much ready to do some trials uh, to make sure that the electronics were all shaken down and, and do some road trials. Um, a thousand apologies. Uh, this happened to be a moment in my life when uh, I was fond of shaky camera technique and uh, low-res video. But um, it's, the, it's the only video I have of uh, when I had, had this thing all put together. But uh, it's a walk around that kind of shows you the, uh, the low voltage RC electronics, um, you know, some of, the, some of the electronics for voltage step down for all the different split systems, speed controller, where I mounted the horn, and, um, and just some of the features um, that are on the dashboard. Uh, so this has a, an on-off switch and a kill switch. So uh, in order to operate the car, you have to turn on a regular on-off switch, uh, which is keyed. Uh, and then it also has a kill switch, uh, which, which basically just cuts all of the, um, uh, all the remote control functions. So if there was, you know, the, the idea is that there's anything goes sideways, you, you can just throw a switch and it just, it inherits everything. Um, so... Just shows setting up the uh, the initialization procedure, kind of like a regular RC car when uh, when you flip it on. Um, it goes through its uh, full range of motion for the steering control, and then it this shows you kind of the ratio metric inputs um, that allow you to throttle the uh, the drive system. So it's not it's not an on off switch like a Power Wheels. It actually has some level of intelligence to it. So it operates in forward and reverse just with the flick of a finger. Uh, this also shows the battery meter. So it, it looks like a, a mock fuel gauge, uh, but it, as opposed to having just a voltmeter, which doesn't give you state of charge measurement. All right, frame and chassis are fully assembled. We'll do a little, little jog around the yard here just to try everything out. Seems to be working pretty good. Going through the tall grass. Try 
reverse. Let's see here. Not too shabby. With the chassis finished, I moved on to the interior fitments. The seat that came with the kit had the looks and texture of a bag of microwave popcorn, so I busted out the sewing machine for some tuck and roll cushions and side panels. The dash got a bead roll treatment and it was vinyl wrapped to match the interior. On the exterior, I started with some bling. The kit headlights were pretty anemic, so I opted to add some uh, function to them by harvesting the guts out of some cheapo LED flashlights. Uh, and lenses were made by molding some plexiglass with a heat gun and uh, a form made out of PVC pipe. These miniature headlight assemblies were held in place with uh, modified headlight bezels. I know what you're thinking, man, this is really overkill. And you're right, but you do have to admit that it looks pretty cool. Back to the bead roller. I wanted to add some personality to the windshield area. This was clearly one of the cheesiest parts in the kit. It really didn't fit the street rod aesthetic that my client didn't even know she wanted. Using some 30 gauge sheet metal, I started forming up a Duval style center post windscreen that was more appropriate for a 40s era roadster. This would get attached to the body eventually with hard rivets after I painted it. I also cut out the grill to give it a more realistic look and added a stainless mesh wire which got trimmed out with aluminum beadwork. The chassis was stripped down and then uh, all the frame and the steering parts were painted using a black urethane automotive paint. The bodywork was next. The first step being to eliminate the visible seams and a whole lot of low spots and get some kind of straightness established using lightweight body filler. This was blocked out by hand with uh, 80 grit and some boards. A series of primer coats were then done uh, and blocked out using 120 grit progressively up through 400 grit to get all the surfaces flattened out. The final 400 grit was wet sanded, uh, and then it was all wet out to visualize any waves or irregular surfaces that may have been missed. When it looks perfect in this wet out phase, it's a good indication of what the final top coat will produce and save you, uh, you know, save for some orange peel. Um, I then hit it with a final sealer coat and then two coats of matte black. Um, which I was kind of disappointed in since I knew how absolutely stunning this would have been with, uh, you know, two more coats of, of clear. But my customer wanted this rat rod appearance, uh, and, and that's what I gave her. That's what I gave her. Uh, the windshield was painted along with the body, uh, and then it was attached later with hard rivets once everything was cured. This satin finished paint job actually turned out pretty good, all things considered. I'm not a big fan of the satin finish, but it's really clean uh, on this car, and it, it stands out really well once uh, once you have the wheels painted. Um, but it was a blank canvas at this point, so I took that opportunity to bust out my pinstriping kit and uh, get brushed up on my chops. Now, I'll be the first to admit that doing this kind of stuff is really hard. Um... Uh, People that do it professionally, that make it look effortless, I have to tip my hat to them uh, because this stuff is really, really tricky, and you got to do a lot of practice to get a uh, to get not just an eye but a hand for it. Um, but I, I threw down some two tone stripes, uh, and then I I started installing some of the trim work so these um, uh, these portholes uh, got a matching screen detail like the grill did, and I installed those with some hard rivets. Uh, the wheels were next, uh, so that was relatively simple. They're just a uh, monochromatic spray out in, uh, in a really brilliant red to match the interior. Uh, and just making sure I masked the tires uh, to keep any of the overspray uh, off, the, off the rubber. And then it got fitted out to the chassis, and I installed the hubcaps. Now all that was left was to put the grill in and uh, rig up a hinge at the front bumper that allows the body to tilt up and, and so you can work on the chassis and access the batteries if you need to. Uh, it, has, it has a check strap on it, which uh, keeps it from falling over, overextending and smashing into the ground. Um, 
And then the last piece was just some bead rolled aluminum inserts and red plexiglass lenses uh, that rounded out the tail lights. Now, like all hot rods, uh, there's always some last minute tuning right up to the reveal at the big birthday party. And after a momentary period of fear, uh, my client took to it like a pro. And uh, with dad at the controls of the RC transmitter, she took to it really when I showed her how to, how to use the horn. Uh, and as soon as she her finger touched that and she heard it for the first time, uh, her hand was pretty much glued to it. And then with Hover Mom, no more than a couple of feet away, she was off cruising with Cousin and honking at studs. Thank you.